Hey guys, so today we're going to be developing a Twitter clone, right? So we're going to do the system design of Twitter, right? So a great way to start an interview like this is to, right, talk with the interviewer and really understand what's the functionality that the interviewer wants you to implement, right? That's pretty important to solving the problem. So for today, we're going to focus on, right, these four bullet points, right? The first bullet is user authentication, which we have a little star next to. Um, the reason we have stars is because we're not really going to be covering that in depth in here. Um, we're just going to imagine that all of our endpoints are authenticated. Um, and the reason is that like to go into an interview like this, you should be expected to know how user authentication works. And I don't think that's a best use of our time to cover. Right? I think we have like some meat in these bullet points that we actually need to cover um, and are really integral to how the system is designed. So moving on to the second bullet, right? Users need to be able to tweet, right? Of course, I need to be able to input content into the platform and I need other people to see it. And along the lines of other people being able to see it, right? I need users to be able to follow other users, right? So that way Bob can follow Mary and Bob can see all of Mary's tweets on their timeline. Now, speaking of timelines, right, we'll move on to the last bullet, right? Users see a timeline and this timeline contains the tweets of the people that they follow. So that way, you know, if Mary's like, hey, I'm having a great day, you know, Bob is able to see that on his timeline because Bob follows Mary. So throughout this right system design, we're going to start from going very basic, right? So we're going to talk about like the design, you know, like how exactly do we want things to look? Then we'll kind of get into, you know, like how can we basically design the system, right? So like really basic elements. And then finally, we'll get into like the real meat of everything um, with like tons of users, right? All connecting to one thing. And we're going to really get into how to scale everything up. So as I mentioned, right, we'll start off by going over some simple application design, right? It's good to start an interview with this, right? Whether you're going to draw it out or just speak about it just so that way the interviewer and you have a common basis of what is understood right so let's start with the timeline right there's an expectation that the timeline is going to be a page of tweets right each of these blocks is a tweet um, and i imagine there's right there's some sort of button at the top of the page and that allows me to go to the new tweet screen on this new tweet screen right i can write 120 characters of content right as we do on normal twitter and then we'll click tweet and when i click tweet i expect this to show up on you know the people who follow me's timelines and finally right in order for, to actually have a time timeline of people that we follow um, and see that the tweets that they post, right, we need to have a profile page where people are able to follow and unfollow people. So we'll just display their username, right? I put a profile picture here, right? We're not going to implement that on our service, right? You can think about it on your own, but the meat of it is right that there's a follow and unfollow button. And when I follow somebody, all of their tweets are going to show up on my timeline. Now let's move on to actually getting into the endpoints. If you're enjoying this video, we have plenty more awesome data structure algorithm and system design explanations nations on interviewpen.com. You can ask us any questions you have about any kind of topics surrounding data structures and algorithms and system design. We release two to four videos a week. You can run your code. You can talk to a personalized AI teaching assistant. And yeah, the site's pretty great. Anyway, enjoy the video. Right. I again have this star on our endpoints, right? Because as I mentioned, we're going to assume that all of these endpoints, you know, like follow, tweet and unfollow, etc. Right. There's more on the next page that are going to be authenticated, right? We're assuming that authentication is involved in this and we're not really gonna get into, right, like adding extra parameters like a session token or anything like that. So first of all, right, in order to tweet something, right, I'm gonna tweet it, uh, we'll use a post, right? I mean, that's pretty intuitive. We're modifying the server and ironically, right, we post a tweet, right? It kind of follows even in the English language and how we do this. In order for a tweet to be posted, right, we need the content that the user wrote and we need the timestamp of when they wrote it. Let's note that this timestamp right now is local right it's on the client side you know this introduces some issues right like what if the client wants to report like a bogus you know timestamp so you know, about 1997 you know I tweeted this in the past or something like that so there is an idea you know you could always move this to be server side so I would end up somewhere maybe in the response or just like say it's in the database somewhere um, that's just one thing to note and I think for the demonstration of this problem it's good to just keep it in the param so that way we understand like you know what is involved in posting a tweet and then in order to see tweets of people we you know we want to be able to follow them um so we'll be able to follow this is going to be a post just because we're like modifying some data we'll provide the username of the user that we want to post and then we'll simply return whether it's successful or not you know have i already followed this person or not then right post or sorry unfollow right follows the same kind of guidelines right you can unfollow somebody by their username and we'll return whether you successfully do it now notice how in all of these endpoints right i don't include anything like you know the session or like you know the username of the person who did it right i don't need the user 
username here. And that's simply because, right, we're assuming that this is authenticated. Okay, now you'll notice on this page that we haven't talked about our timeline. And that's because as I mentioned, the timeline is kind of the meat of the problem. So let's move on and discuss that on its own. So this is a lot, but we're gonna get through it. All right, we can start off by seeing our timeline here. This is what a standard timeline is gonna have on it. You know, people write stuff um, and it shows it. Now the thing is, is we don't wanna have to load every single tweet that would be on somebody's timeline at once, right? Like, you know, otherwise I would have to load all of the data, right? The timeline is of infinite length. The request time is just only gonna increase for the client as people, as they follow people and the people who they follow tweet. So instead we'll turn this in to be paginated, right? So our pagination, right? We'll say that these are n tweets, right? So every page of tweets has n tweets on it, right? And in order to implement pagination while we know what n is, right? How do we know that we want to get this n, right? Like, you know, how do we know where to start? So typically in a paginated API, we'll have like the page index. So right, this is like page zero. Down here we have page one. Now the problem you can start to see is what if we start to consider new tweets, right? So if our page index, right, is, is page zero, if I re-requested this over time as we get new tweets and we naively implement this, right, then the N is going to shift to be this, right? So let's say for right now, we completely ignore the fact that there's new tweets, but they on the client side, but they're still being input in the database. So if I say that I wanna get, you know, page one worth of tweets, right, the next N, if I think that these new tweets are in the database are going Going to be down here, right? So now I have this overlap and the overlap is the number of tweets that it got stacked on the top. So of course that doesn't work, right? So how exactly do we reference a timeline pages, you know, being relative to a certain tweet? Like we want, I want to get everything that's after this tweet or right, like after this one, etc. So in order to do that, right, we'll consider new tweets and we can just replace the page number with the timestamp of the tweet we're at. Another option is just to use like tweet ID. So right, if I did ID, right, I could also just say get like, you know, the next N after the ID, um, but you can also achieve this with timestamp, right? Like we want everything that happened, you know, after this one. So then as I scroll on the client, I'll just send requests, right? To my timeline endpoint, right? This is a get request because we're getting data and we're just going to provide this, you know, the start timestamp of where we want to start looking and then we'll return the end tweets. Now you notice here, I decided to keep the N on the server side. Um, and that's purely because, you know, if I left N to be arbitrary to the client, they could just request as many as they wanted to, which of course doesn't work because, you know, then I could just request on my client something this long and then I could crash my service, right? And this, you know, evil guy would be really happy, but all of our, you know, normal users would be pretty sad. Now, moving on to actually considering how are we going to handle the new tweets on the top, right? When we implemented pagination and we did things with our timestamp, uh, we just kind of ignored the fact that we had these showing up and we want there to be a real-time timeline, right? I want to see new tweets as people tweet them. So to achieve this in a really basic fashion, which you might you know, disagree with, and that's good because we're going to kind of go over this later and how we can actually scale the problem even larger, right, is to do real-time updates by polling changes, right? So by polling, I mean that the client, you know, like every, you know, 10 seconds is going to send a request to our API and they're going to get back, right, a list of all the tweets that are new. And those tweets get to be stuck at the top of the timeline, right? In order to poll something, you have to decide how often you're going to do it. So for example, let's just choose that we're going to do it every second. In order to do this polling, and since we left it separate than our, right, get timeline endpoint, we're going to make a get updates endpoint. And here we're going to provide the, the tweet timestamp of the first element in our timeline, right? So this, this like, Timestamp is going to update, you know, once I get these tweets, right, this is the highest timestamp. You know, if I haven't gotten these yet, this is the highest timestamp, right? That way we can always get everything that's new. And then it's going to return all of the new tweets that are available to the problem. Or sorry, available for the timeline. Okay, right. So now we've solved the actual timeline problem and we have our endpoints to be able to, you know, as we mentioned before, be able to tweet, follow and unfollow people. And then we can request a timeline when we first load the page. And then we can also see updates over time. Now, as I said, right, you might not be happy with this solution and that's great, but to move on with this kind of naive solution as I present it, right, let's talk about how exactly you would design a system like this. So we'll get into a basic system design, right? Really highlight on basic. Think about, you know, as I'm explaining this and as we move on, how can you improve this to, you know, be scalable uh, in the future um, and support like millions of users per day, right? Both reads and writes. So we'll start off with our user, Bob, right? Bob is connecting to a browser, which is an assumption we kind of made at the beginning of the problem by choosing a REST API, right? Like maybe we have our own Twitter client if we really wanted to. That is something you could probably discuss with the interviewer, but I think it's a great thing to just start with assuming that you're building a web service because that is the majority of services in our world today, right? 
So Bob has his machine. He's going to connect through the public internet to our REST API, right? REST is over HTTP. So I noted that we have HTTP here, all right? We have all the endpoints that we decided on before. So this REST API will handle that. And notice that we only have one instance of it as well as, right? We just have a database that backs it. We're going to choose SQL for this, right? Just because it's great to start an interview with, you know, a de facto, you know, relational database. Uh, SQL is a great start and it's a great, like, you know, common place that both the interview and you understand. While you can use other solutions, it's good to kind of relate it to a relational database. Okay, so now that we're done, right, designing the basic system, what are some issues you can kind of start to identify, right? Like, what if I want to support multiple users, right? Right now, we've only really decided that there's one user, Bob, and how can that affect, right, both the load of our REST API and the load of our SQL database? Let's say you get to this basic system, right? A great question that the interviewer could ask you is which one do you think is going to fail first, right? Do you think the REST API will fail first? Do you think the database will fail first? And you can argue either way, all right? Personally, I would say the database is going to fail first, just simply because like this REST API is probably going to be able to handle a lot of endpoints at once. We're not maintaining a ton of like connections between everything just because we're using standard HTTP. So that means like, you know, the size of our database, the, you know, the disks um, associated with it, the hardware in general, that can really be a bottleneck. But you could also make arguments towards the REST API as well, based on your knowledge of how you would implement it. Okay. So since we mentioned that we have a SQL database, let's talk a little bit about how we see the schema being designed, right? It's a common place in a system design interview to discuss a rough schema. It doesn't have to be a perfect implementation or anything like that, but it, it does under right, give a common understanding of how the data is going to look like when it's actually stored. So we'll start off, right? We I kind of have three different tables. We'll just go in them in order, right? Let's start off with the users table, right? We need to store the users whenever they authenticate, right? Just, you can kind of put that star from the beginning here, right? Authentication, right? Maybe this also would have like their past passwords and things like that, right? The for our like really, really basic example, right? All we really need to do store is the username. There might be initial data later, but username is that the root of our problem. I've chosen varchar 30, right? Let's just imagine that the usernames are 30 characters max in length, um, but that's a decision you should discuss, right? How big, how big do you want these to be? And that can affect storage capacity as well, right? And I've marked this to be the primary key um, because like, you know, each username represents a unique row in this table. Now moving on to tweets, right? Your tweets are actually, is actually going to contain the content of of the tweets, right? So there is an ID for each of these tweets. And you'll notice that I've kind of marked this as question marks, right? Like what should the ID be, right? You could just make this an int and it'll increase, but like maybe you want it to be a UUID, right? Like maybe it's some other sort of hash, right? So this is the primary key because it'll uniquely represent a tweet, but it has to be unique, right? And it, it's kind of up to you to decide how you want to do that. That doesn't really affect how we're going to design the rest of the problem, but it is something to consider. Moving on, right? We need the actual username of the user who posted the tweet, of course, right? And we'll notice that these two types between the users and username table are the same. And that's because we would create some sort of referential integrity constraint between those two fields, right? We want them in the database to have some sort of relationship that these two are between each other. And that includes matching the data type. Next, we'll need the content of the tweet, right? So what did the person actually write, right? We've made this varchar 120 simply because like 120 characters is the maximum size for a tweet, right? Uh, but there are impl other implications to this, right? Like does this affect size? As an interview could ask like database size, why not just use text, right? There's all kinds of different arguments and definitely think about you know different, you know, problem scenarios for that. Then finally, you also need the time, right? So you need the timestamp of when exactly the tweet was created. And that's super important because we have a time timeline of tweets, right? So we need to be able to order them by when they're created. If we don't have the timestamp, um, then how are we going to order them? You'll notice that I used like the timestamp value. Some databases might not support this, right? You might have to use like a string. So that would be like varchar, other thing, you know, other databases might use like time as the name, but it's good that if there is a de facto standard for a time or timestamp or date time, et cetera, in your database, it's good to use that type. So that way when we're writing queries, um, it's very easy to do like, for example, comparisons. And finally, right, we have the follows table. And this is representing the idea that like, you know, Mary follows Bob, right? So Mary wants to see all of the tweets that Bob posts. So the username here is would be Mary in that example, right? And this is varchar 30 simply because it's the same thing as up here from the users. Um, and this would also, you know, be some sort of reference when you would describe it in your relational database, as well as the fact that you have right the following, right? And following would be in our example, it would be Bob, right? because Mary follows Bob. So Mary is following Bob. And since this is username, we're going to match the same type. And we probably would create some sort of reference between these 
in our uh, relational database. Now, I definitely take some time to consider like how exactly could you write some queries, right? Like, do you know how to look up, you know, all of the users that start with a certain thing, uh, right? Like maybe I want all users that start with like Wes in my service, right? Like think about how you could write some queries to actually organize tweets in a timeline, right? What does that look like? These are definitely grounds that a system design interview just to go over some basic queries to help you understand and things like that. But think about how to develop the timeline as a join, right? Between follows and tweets, right? That's a great example of a query question. Now let's move on to actually starting to deal with the load in our system, right? So as we said before, right, we had like a single, you know, user, they were connecting to, you know, some service and then we had the database. The problem was is that we only had one instance of each of those and when we started con to consider a lot of different users, how do you think that the one user was going to be able to handle that? Now, right, so looking at the left, we have a lot of clients present here, right? This represents like, you know, let's say this is like one million users, right? And we're going to start horizontally scaling, which is what these three dots represent, uh, our REST API, right? So we'll have multiple instances of it to be able to handle all of the load that exists. Now, since we have multiple instances of our REST API, right, how is a client on their browser, right? So I just like, you know, navigated to google.com in my search bar. How am I going to know that I should go to this REST API or I should go to this one, right? Like, you know, this is a level of complexity that the user shouldn't need to deal with and we want to load balance it. So as you can imagine, right, we're going to put in a load balancer. We kind of just draw this as a large box, right? A load balancer is a distributed system in itself, right? It can have its own, all sorts of complexities. So definitely do your research. But I think a great place to start is, you know, what layer, OSI layer, is the load balancer going to lay on? So, right, it's going to sit at layer four. The reason I've chosen layer four is because that's a transport layer. So it has an idea of, you know, like that there is a packet and the packet has data in it. Um, but all we can really do is just evenly distribute these packets between all of our different REST API endpoints, right? Note that in layer four, we don't have any idea that like, you know, this is an endpoint that might contain, you know, like get a timeline, right? We have no idea, right? Like what HTTP even is, it, you know, to begin with, but also what is an HTTP endpoint and, you know, how can we, you know, distribute load based on that. Now, when every request comes in, it goes through the load balancer, gets you know chosen to go to a certain REST API, and then the request will go to our SQL database. Now, looking at this diagram, we can pretty definitively say, right, that the SQL database is the first thing to fail, right? Like we have a scalable REST API, we can scale this based on the number of users we have. We have a load balancer in front of it, which is by definition required to scale in itself and to be able to support our platform, right? But the problem is, is how exactly do we deal with this database, right? We only have one of them. Um, that's one server and that's definitely not gonna handle, right, the million users that I mentioned over here. So moving on to dealing, you know, with load, but within respect to that database failure, right? We can think about how exactly we're gonna scale the database. So in order to to scale the database, right? I guess the first option for us to do is to do master and follower replication, right? So these are all like read replica nodes, um, and this is a master node. So when somebody, you know, writes a tweet, right? So we'll just designate it as a W, that's going to go to the master, right? And our write will be put on that master, and then it's going to propagate to all of our read replicas. Then whenever we receive a read request, we'll go through our REST API, and then we can go to any one of our read replicas, including the master. Now, this is great right? We can scale in general, right? We know that systems typically have more reads than writes, especially in terms of Twitter. We have lots of people who are just reading content, right? So they're just coming in and they're just going to go to one of these read replicas. And we aren't super, super scared about, you know, does this data need to be consistent? Because like, you know, if I don't see that Bob tweeted five seconds ago, you know, when I pull up his profile, that's probably okay. Now we can start to get into a problem whenever we're starting to discuss rights, right? So if I have a lot of rights coming through and they're going to my master, my master is the single point of failure for my rights, which is of course, a very big problem, right? Like we've scaled our system in terms of reads, right? We can put all of these read replicas on different servers in our data center, right? So imagine these are our server racks. But the problem is, is that we're still sending all of our writes to this one master node. And that means that we're going to have to scale this vertically, give it lots of more hardware, you know, great SSDs, RAM, et cetera. 
So how exactly can we deal with that? Firstly, we're going to have to split up our read and write APIs to be separate, right? That way we can scale our read load and our write load separately, right? So we write these dots to horizontally scale each of these services. Um, and that means that we can say, okay, you know, we get more reads than writes. So let's create, you know, a bunch of, of read instances, but maybe not as many people write. So let's make fewer of those. Now you'll notice that we still have our load balancer, but the there's a note down here that we're now layer seven. The reason we're at layer seven is now we have a distinction between when a request comes in. So remember before we had a write, right? And that write in our last diagram could go to any one of our instances. If we kept this to be at layer four, then that means that when a write came in, it might just be assigned to a read API. So what do you do? Like send a request there? Like that's very confusing, right? That's just like weirdly balancing load. So instead we'll lay it at layer seven, right? And layer seven has the idea that we have something like get timeline. And this get timeline request is going to come through, go straight to the read API. And we have, when we have a post for a tweet, right? That's a write. And this write is going to go straight to the write API. Now getting into, you know, the huge changes that we have here is about our database, right? So before we had, right, our master and we had all of our replicas over here. But the problem was, is that, right, we weren't balancing our write load very well, but we were, we were balancing the read load very well. So what we can kind of naturally get into what's a great solution for dealing with distributed write is to talk about creating shards. So as we can see down here, right, we have many shards. We're horizontally scaling them. That's what we indicate by these three dots. Right, we have shard one through shard n. Now, immediately, right when we get into a sharded database, we have to decide how exactly are we going to split up chunks of data between our different shards, right? And in order to do that, we need a shard key, right? A shard key, it can either be used to decide those chunks or it can be used like in a hash algorithm to then be deciding the chunks, etc. right? There's definitely, you know, a ton of research and articles you can, you know, find based on chart keys. And there's a lot of, right, discussion around how to pick a best one. But in general, right, there's three different, like, bullet points we really need to consider. Those are the, like, you know, huge points to hit um, in order to decide, you know, what shard key we should use. So first of all, right, we need there to be a high cardinality for the key. You know, an example of, you know, a low cardinality key is something like, you know, uh, continent, right? How many continents are there? There's only seven. So that means that we only have seven real different chunks, right? So like, does that, how are we going to fit that on more than seven nodes, right? If we have a bunch, right? Like at a certain point, we just can't place, you know, a shard chunk, you know, there's just going to be empty machines. We also need there to be a low frequency of each key. So the problem as well with our seven continents, right, is the problem that like a ton of people might fit into the US continent, right? But the EU continent is much smaller, right? Like in term smaller as in, you know, the, the amount of data that is going to it and being saved with relevance to the EU. We also need to consider, right, is this good for our query patterns, right? Like, are we commonly making requests that have to do with the fact that something is in the US or something is in the EU? I mean, maybe, right? But it's pretty unlikely um, that that's like the, the major, uh, you know, query pattern that we have, right? There is an idea that, you know, a lot of like different user locales might listen to each other, right? They might, I might follow Bob purely because Bob is like an expert at science, you know, in English, but there are people in Spanish that probably might follow Mary because Mary is an expert in science and she speaks Spanish. That isn't a majority of the reason to consider a query pattern, right? Because the query pattern, the biggest query pattern in our service is our timeline, right? We need uh, different tweets to be related together on a timeline. So to start suggesting some shard keys, right? A, a great default is to do user ID, right? But the problem with user ID is that, right? If I have something, you know, somebody like Elon Musk, right? I'll just pay EM, right? Elon Musk might have a ton of tweets on his timeline, right? Versus me, like Wes, right? Like I only have like one round of two, right? Like I don't tweet that much, but other people do. So that can create an imbalance, right? Um, and that leads to different frequency levels, right? But that does satisfy our high cardinality agreement. And it semi has follows that good 
query pattern, right? We When we request our timeline, there is some relevance to a user, but not completely, right? It, but it's it's there, it's there. Now, the next thing we can go to is something, you know, like uh, the ID of a tweet, right? And that's really great because there's a low frequency of each tweet ID. There's only one of them. There's a super high cardinality, right? Like every single tweet has its own unique ID. And it is semi-decent for query patterns. It's great for saying that I need to get a specific tweet, but the problem that tweet ID, you know, really has is that when we have a timeline, right, the goal is time, right? The relevance factor we have to time is super high on our service. These are all related to each other in time, right? Not just tweet ID. So that means, right, it kind of implies, right, that our tweet, that we should kind of use tweet ID to kind of get an even balance across all of our shard nodes, right? But then we use timestamp to get some sort of data locality in terms of time, right? And that can really relates to Twitter themselves, right? Twitter themselves uses something called a snowflake. That is the data type that represents a tweet ID. Um, and I invite you to read, you know, do more research on what exactly a tweet ID is because like, this is really important, right? Like why exactly did they choose this? And companies today will use snowflake because uh, it's very important, right? It's very effective at solving the problem. Now, before we move on, we definitely want to notice how right, we're still putting a ton of load on the database. We have like horizontally scaled it and we're distributing the load you know, across like, you know, a, a lot of different machines. But the problem is, is we're still relying really heavily on a disk based system, right? So like a lot of this stuff might still be on the disk, right? Maybe, you know, not all of the data that fits on a single shard based on our shard sizes can all fit in memory. So the idea there is to start including a memory cache somewhere in here, right? And we're kind of going to get into that in a bit, but I just wanted to mention it here just to think about, you know, where could a problem exist? But right now we're in a very good place, right? We we have a load balancer, right? We're balancing our load, which we can horizontally scale to read versus write right? Like th that's a pretty great distinction to have, right? And we have a super scalable database, right? In the end, like at this point, we have developed a solution that works. But one thing we like still haven't considered is the fact that we're still doing our polling from our clients, right? So we're spending a lot like on all of these a million users uh, or more, right? Sending tons of requests like every second asking if there's new tweets, hitting our read API, making us scale this read API to be huge, right? The read API, if we're doing that polling based solution is gonna be like orders of magnitude you know, scaled higher than our write API. So let's get into how exactly we want to design the timeline to be able to fix that problem. So moving into a real time timeline, right? And how exactly are we going to solve the problem of polling? Now, looking at our timeline, right, we see right, that we just have our standard timeline, right, there's all of the tweets we saw, right, we're still doing our pagination, right, there's end tweets, you know, here and here, et cetera, and things like that. All right, we're gonna kind of add a section up here that states how many new tweets we have. So, right, we have three new tweets available. And when the user clicks this, which is what we're implying by this arrow, we're going to load all of the new tweets. Now, in order to achieve this, this, you know, notification of three new tweets, we need a way to get from our service over to the client, right? We need the arrow to be the other way. Right now, all of our arrows are existing, right, towards our service. So it can only be pull-based. We need something push-based towards the client. And whenever you think about, you know, push base to the client, especially in the aspect of web browsers, we go straight to thinking about WebSockets, right? So these WebSockets create a bi-directional channel between our service, which is the API and the client. And that's perfect for solving this, right? We can send a notification that we should display on the client that there's three new tweets available. So, right, we have our read API and we have our write API. And I want to get into how exactly is the system going to work when, for example, Bob follows Mary, right? So we're going to draw Bob follows Mary. And, right, if Mary tweets, how exactly is Bob going to get the notification that there's three new tweets available and know to click the button that will read more tweets? So first of all, Mary tweets, right? She writes, you know, like, I'm, I'm so happy today, right? And her tweet is going to go into the write API, right? And since we kind of spoke about our memory cache last time, right, we hadn't written in our diagram yet, we're sticking it in here, 
right? So we have our memory cache between uh, the database and the read and write APIs. Now that's super important because no longer are we super dependent on disk, right? We have everything in memory. We know from you know our experience that memory is really, really fast. So when Mary produces this tweet, right, it goes into our write API and then we're going to we're going to write this, you know, into our memory cache and in turn that's going to go to the database. Now, let's look a little bit at how, right, our memory cache is going to look like internally, right? So a great way to solve this, right, is that Bob has a list of tweets that exist in this memory cache. And we need to fix the size of, you know, this list of tweets because if we don't, we're spending an infinite amount of memory storing an infinitely long timeline for Bob, right? Is that really necessary? Probably not. So, we'll just limit this to, for example, 100 tweets. And every single time, right, we fill up the tweet list, right, like, like we'll just keep popping off elements on the end when it becomes too big. Now, you'll notice that I've also written down that we're going to evict after five days. That's important because, you know, this memory cache also grows to infinite size, which it will regardless based on how our users, you know, if our users are using our platform more, we will need more resources. I mean, that's always true. Um, but the thing is, is we're not growing our memory cache to be the size of all of the users that have ever existed in the lifetime of our service, right? So by evicting things, right, that way we can actually get rid of, you know, this high speed cache that we introduced, right, if a user isn't active on our platform for five days. Now that we have this solved, right, and we know that our tweets, uh, right, like when Mary tweets, we're going to go through the right API and we're going to stick in Bob's right memory cache that uh, these are the new tweets that exist right and then we're also going to store in the database that Mary tweeted that that's great right we've solved that we've improved our read speed uh, made you know ha have a memory cache memory is really fast now the problem is is how exactly is Bob's client going to see that there's three new tweets on the top of his timeline right we haven't solved that problem so what we can do right is that when when Mary's tweet comes in and it goes into the right API, right, we've already put in the memory cache. But in order to get Bob to know that Mary has tweeted, right, in the right API, we calculated, you know, all of the followers that Mary has and updated all of the memory cache of her followers with her tweet. Now, that's like, in general, called a fan out, right? We fanned out, like, Mary's tweet to all of her followers. Now, in order for that fan out to actually notify the the person on the timeline, right, we can use a message queue like Kafka, right? Kafka is a great example of an, a real world uh, usage of a message queue. It's highly scalable, right? And we can produce messages, right, having topics, right? We're using the Kafka terminology here. So I want to keep it, you know, consistent by saying, you know, our topic would be like, you know, Bob. Right? And so since we've created this WebSocket, right, our read API has this connection between Bob and the read API constantly sitting there. So the, each read API instance that handles a WebSocket can listen for updates right, that include Bob's name. So the write API, we'd emit something, including Bob, right? It would go through, right, Kafka, right? There's some pipe in here, right, for our specific topic. And then Bob is going to be, you know, consumed by the read API. And then the read API can notify Bob, you know, through a push-based system that there is a new tweet available for him to read. Then when Bob clicks the new tweets option, right, he'll send a request to the read API. The read API is going to go to the memory cache and it's going to figure out that Mary's tweet is at the beginning of Bob's memory cache list. So we've pretty effectively solved, you know, how exactly are we going to achieve a real-time timeline? How are we going to notify people that there are updates and how are we going to scale this over time, right? Like Kafka is highly distributed, highly scalable. We solved their database before. Memory cache in general, right, we can horizontally scale this. Let's remember that a memory cache is, right, a distributed system in itself. So we need to take that into consideration and know memory caches really well if we're going to introduce them into the diagram. But in general, we've built a great system, right, for these tweets to fan out to all of the users that are using our service. Now that we've solved the meat of the problem, which is the timeline, right, we can move on to finally completing our diagram, right, including everything that would decide on the timeline, how we scale the database, the read and write APIs, right, our layer set and load balancer, right? So we have our layer seven load balancer, right? Layer seven is not noted, but it inherently needs to be layer seven because we have a read and write API. You'll notice that the read API has 
the bi-directional arrows now between the load balancer and the read API. And that's because, right, the WebSocket exists, you know, whether it's in the read API or in the load balancer, the read API, right, the way we've designed it is that it consumes from Kafka. And at some point it has to notify the load balancer to send something on the WebSocket. And these WebSocket connections are typically going to be maintained between the client and the load balancer, right? Think that we, as we include WebSockets, that's not right an easy and cheap decision, right? There are implications in that. It is a question that, right, you should be prepared to answer, right? Our load balancer now has to handle state, right? Of like clients having a persistent connection and things like that. Um, and somehow communicating with our read API in a push-based manner. With that complexity aside though, right? We've introduced these bi-directional arrows to represent that push-pull relationship between the two. And we noticed that, you know, let's say this is Mary, if Mary stuff comes in, right, it's going to go to the right API because Mary's writing a tweet. And then uh, the right API is going to produce, right, it's going to do its its fan out, right? So it's going to fan out and say, we need to go to Bob and notify Bob that he has updates. Uh, that's going to travel through Kafka, which is a distributed system in itself. It's going to be consumed by the read API. The read API is going to notify, right, somehow of an event to the load balancer that should be sent through the WebSocket. And Bob now knows, right, that he can clear like, right, there's one new tweet from Mary. And when he clicks that, right, it's gonna go to the load balancer, go to the read API, it's gonna go down and hit our memory cache. Right. As we did that write example, right, I didn't include that we we're gonna go to the memory cache just for sake of brevity, right? But we are writing things in our memory cache like we discussed before. So, right, looking at this, right, we have a highly scalable database. It's sharded, it has failover replication, right? There's replica sets here. And I wanna note, right, knowing what database technologies support this kind of sharding is important, right? Like maybe you wanna discuss with the interviewer how that works, right? A common ideology, this looks a lot like the Mongo replication system, right? And sharding system, right? These would be designed as replica sets, right? In the Mongo system, there used to be some sort of Mongo S here, right? And that handles um, all of the queries and things like that. And then we stuck a memory cache in front of it. But let's note that, right, some databases might have this memory cache built in, and this would be included in the database, right? And you would make your database nodes have enough memory to keep their uh, shard chunks in memory, right? And handle everything we have here. In our system, it's pretty beneficial, right? That we have our own like memory cache design where we remember we had like Bob and we had a list of things that, right, like Bob, you know, was in his timeline, right? That's very beneficial for us. But there are like different ways to design this and it's great to think about how to do it on your own. But yeah, right, we have a very scalable system um, between Kafka, our scaled database, our memory cache, our, read and, our split read and write APIs that can be horizontally scaled on their own, which is all behind a load balancer. And imagine at this point, right, there are some additional questions that an interviewer can ask you based on your level of expertise, right? Like, could you throughout this interview discuss the implications on the resources that you would need, right? How much memory is this memory cache going to take up based on the requirements we set out? How much, like, how many read API instances do you think you'll need? You know, how costly is the load balancer going to be to be able to persist these WebSocket connections, right? How costly is this database to manage, right? Those are all like great questions that, you know, an interviewer could ask. And there's also additional things, right? Like we kind of just like drew the diagram, but like, you know, how exactly, you know, where does this stuff lie in terms of like network boundaries, right? There's, right, there's typically like network boundaries here, right? You might like, you know, break things up to have some sort of like security principles and things like that. And finally, right, like, you know, if you're scaling this, how do you scale them? Do you use a container orchestrator or some other solution, right? That's up for you to understand. But in general, right, we've developed a very scalable system that actually follows, you know, in some respects, what exactly Twitter is doing today to achieve their results, right? So I'm happy that we got to this point. But remember that there's always so many areas you can go deeper and deeper into a problem like this. If you enjoyed that video, you can get a lot more content just like this on interviewpen.com. We publish two to four videos a week. Really, it's just an arbitrary number. It's whenever I can sit down and do a video because these videos take a whole day to do. And we're always online to answer any questions you may have. Join our Discord. Join our newsletter, The Blueprint, where you can get more weekly data structure and algorithm and system design kind of topics. And subscribe and like this video if you actually like this video and it helped you. And also tell a friend that we exist. That's all.